we have a slightly different audience tonight uh, than the one for which this presentation was prepared. Uh, the University of the Third Age, it all sounds rather daunting. The Third Age, I'm told, uh, includes me. It's the, uh, the oldies. But uh, the University of the Third Age uh, study variously, and they, they meet once a month, and they were studying comparative religion. And when they sought for somebody to talk about the Christadelphians, John and I went to Alveston in September last year and gave them this presentation. The idea of the presentation, before we get into it, is simply to explain that we were talking to people who had absolutely no knowledge of Christadelphians. So if you find this all very basic and down to earth, um, what I hope we will achieve tonight is that most of you as Christadelphians and people who've been attending Sunday evenings for a long time, see if you think that we're giving uh, a balanced overview of Christadelphians and, and our community. Uh, John and I are going to alternate and the idea is that we just talk for five minutes so if you want to set your watches we start now. We are an unusual community, as communities go, in that we don't have a head office, there's no overall leadership, and no paid ministry. In fact, as a community, it is remarkable that we function having so little organization. But in actual fact, that's quite deliberate. For Christadelphians seek to be under the influence of the Lord Jesus Christ and very much like the church that he established in Jerusalem that then spread out through the world. It was an organization of people who worked freely in committees but gave freely of their time and energies using their skills for both for the care of the church and also for the preaching of the truth. So other than the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, we need no other leaders. Which means then, it is our ability to remain faithful to our Lord and faithful to the community that binds us together and makes us a community. The uniting cement to which we all acknowledge is that we have a love of the Holy Scriptures. And if there's any propaganda that you will repeatedly hear from Christadelphians, it's that we would encourage people to draw their Christianity from its source and return to the Scriptures. Uh, the preaching of the truth has been, uh, it started in America and then it came to England and uh, it has now spread to uh, many parts of the world. We have a common bond that on the same day we are all encouraging each other to read the same passages of Scripture. <coughs> and one of the wonderful things, if you're feeling low, when you open your passages, you know that Christadelphians all over the world reading the same chapters as you. There's a bond and a fellowship uh, for doing this. We share a fellowship of love and care that stretches around the world. So from darkest Africa, and there's some pretty dark places in Africa, uh, to North America and Canada, uh, throughout the world, communities of Christadelphians are meeting. We tend not to use the word church because a church very often is thought of as the bricks and mortar, the building. So using the Greek, the biblical word for church, the ecclesia, the idea of the ecclesia is the gathering together of um, a community. What also binds us together in our belief is the fact that we do have a common statement of faith. And if you were to uh, go to a tree in Africa where the gospel is being preached, 
or whether you were to come into a centrally heated hall in Northern Europe, or whether you were to be in Australia, you will hear the same message of the gospel uh, being preached by different preachers. The other thing to say about us as a community is that we're completely self-financing and um, gather money for various ventures that we agree we're going to do, we're going to work. So, Christadelphians, where did we come from? Dr. John Thomas was not a doctor of divinity. You'll see he's a medical doctor, having studied at Guy's and Bart's in London. He became not only a doctor, but also a surgeon. So one would regard John Thomas as being uh, quite an academic and a man of considerable skill, who, uh, in seeking in his early life to go to the New World, um, booked on as the ship's surgeon on the Marquis of Wellesley, <coughs> a ship bound for the New World. And in that journey, which is described in his journal, uh, the ship uh, was blown off course in the North Atlantic. Uh, the seas were extremely cold, there were icebergs around, and there was even at one point very great danger that his ship was going to founder of Newfoundland and John Thomas though qualified as a doctor and as a surgeon and though he'd been brought up by his father a non-conformist minister he'd never really satisfied himself as to the meaning of life and what happens to you when you die all the most important questions and he suddenly realized how vulnerable he was so he prayed in the bowels of the ship that if his life was spared when he got to dry land he would make it his first diligent inquiry to search the scriptures and discover the answers to some of the most basic and important questions of life. It might be that similar disasters will affect us and when they do they make us think seriously about uh, the issues that in our youth we think are a long way away. <coughs> well, in America there were many people that um, enjoyed receiving his studies, uh, John Thomas, and um, he used to ask lots of Bible questions and give strings of passages of quotations. He spent 12 years combing through the scriptures. What is the Bible telling me about God? What is the Bible telling me about man? And his copious studies in the Bible led him to ask questions of the community, the Campbellites, where he was then meeting. And then the American Civil War broke out and Christadelphians were found on both sides of the fighting but would not fight. As disciples, following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, they'd rather lay down their lives than take life. And so the name Christadelphian was born. For John Thomas had not sought to create a sect. He just wanted to bind people together that believed the truth and believed the same thing. He thought that organization was a substitute for the true spirit of discipleship and he did not want organization but in the civil war abraham lincoln said well how can we recognize who you are if you haven't got a name and you don't have a membership and so john thomas's followers were really forced by circumstances to taking the name and they chose the name christadelphian an unusual name but a beautiful name when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, he wrote to the faithful brethren in Christ. And there's the name Christadelphian. And we don't know whether Paul ever went to Colossae. And so as Paul doesn't know about us, and may not have met face to face many in the church at Colossae, 
so we bear this name, brethren in Christ, with this important exhortation that we must be faithful, brethren in Christ. Well, today Christadelphians are a worldwide community. I'm not clicking this at all well. Uh, you've written this out beautifully for us. And we are a family community, and uh, you'll find that Christadelphians <coughs> have married into the same families and uh, these families have spread around the world. Now John is going to introduce the Bristol uh, Down End Christadelphians. So pin your ears back from there. Thank you Jim. It's inevitable that the first couple of sessions take a little bit longer than the others but I can assure you they do get shorter. <coughs> However, um, I don't really think you need introducing to yourselves, but I put this in because uh, it's how we showed it to the people who uh, asked us to come and speak to them up in Almondsbury, uh, Alverston, I beg your pardon. Right, so there's where we are, highlighted. And obviously you'll recognise that photograph when I showed it to the people at uh, the presentation we did. One or two ladies said, oh, we know the lady bending, that's Mrs. Janet, isn't it? And, uh, of course, they, they knew Nader because of her gardening work in that area. Uh, and Jim, of course, one of the first people to be baptised in this hall. I think it was the second, wasn't it, Jim? Back about 50 years ago. And uh, Jim's there, still still with us tonight. Uh, and that's Jim. Put it in so as we could show people that we are a vibrant community. It's not a church hall that's got three or four people on a Sunday morning. It's, and this is one of the things that our neighbours in the road have said, you're a very busy church, aren't you? Um, well, it's what we're used to. So that's what we expect, I suppose. We put this in to show that we're quite a normal group of people because the Christadelphians have weddings, um, we get married, we do all sorts of things that other people do. Uh, it's not a wacky community. Uh, we, we enjoy life much as anybody else does. And going back then, this is the hall that we had built in 1955. Well, it was opened in 1955. And we go through, I did put the website up there because uh, at that time somebody may have taken it down and may still be looking at it for all we know. But the hall was built in the early 1950s uh, and it opened on January the 1st, 1955. The new, you remember Jim said we used the word ecclesia management committee's aim was to promote Bible reading both within our own membership and in our regular preaching work and that was one of the first uh, things that the committee the management committee of this ecclesia decided they wanted to promote over the years uh, and of course have but regular Bible daily daily Bible reading is and always has been common throughout the entire Christadelphian community <laughs> across the world so that's nothing new but the committee didn't want to lose sight of that objective which is still as vibrant today as it ever was so there's my personal bible reading planner that was given to me by, by my grandfather back in uh, august 1962 uh, i just worked it out the other day that's 40 46 years um it's frightening but <laughs> there you are and of course if we went through uh, and looked at uh, this page, then you can see that on uh, December the 22nd we will be reading Job 29.30, Zechariah chapters 6 and 7, and Revelation chapters 3 and 4 on the 22nd, which is tomorrow, of course. So, as Jim's already mentioned, Christadelphians will have a talking point common to all of the community on any specific day, anywhere in the world. Have you done the readings today? What do you think about, and, and the subject will come up and people will discuss it. it. It happens very frequently. And if you think that we all fall silent on February the 29th, think again. There's no such thing as a silent Christadelphian. Our services tend to be a meeting point, not just for a religious service, but a time and place to, to catch up before and afterwards with the joys and the sorrows of everyday life, the caring and sharing and enjoying the company of like-minded people. So Christadelphians 
love the Bible. And most Christians will say, well, that's true of me too. We view the Bible as the holy, inspired word of God. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we don't think any of it is out of date. We believe that God is speaking to us through his book, so it's our duty to listen to him. And what he has caused to be written is unchanging. What men have translated can be subject to error, and languages do change. Therefore, we try and check, as much as possible, with the Hebrew and Greek texts, the meanings of words and ideas, so that our understanding reflects the original message as near as is possible. And that's one of the great things about Dr. John Thomas we heard about earlier. He was a scholar in both Hebrew and Greek and was able to see uh, what the, the original text, as far back as he could go, uh, were saying. So that's a little bit about us at Down End. It's by no means all, but you'll probably ask, how do you differ from other Christian sects? Well, part of the answer is how we view and use the Bible. Christadelphians are convinced of the importance of the understanding the whole of Scripture in both the Old and the New Testaments. So Jim is now going to come back and explain what we mean by that by showing how the Gospel was understood by a man called Abraham 2,000 years before the New Testament was written. I'll try and encourage you to keep pushing the buttons, Jim. Thank you and to keep to time. Um, it, it stands to reason that the only Bible that Jesus had as a boy was the Old Testament, because he was born between the Testaments in the Bible. Uh, therefore, if we're going to see the foundation that, that built the faith in Jesus Christ, we've got to look at the Old Testament. This is also borne out by the fact that when he was preaching, he repeatedly was quoting from the Old Testament scriptures, from the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And no wonder, because the Old Testament has some wonderful promises. In Genesis chapter 12, we write in the first book of the Bible, God said to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Thank you. So Jesus' Bible is the one that was quoted. And Old Testament passage from Genesis chapter 12. And you say, well, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed in Abraham's seed. It seems the world has been cursed by the Jews, not blessed by them. But if you listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, where he quotes the very words of Genesis chapter 12. And this scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. See, most of us would grow up thinking that the gospel begins with Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. They're called the gospel records. And yet what we're told here in letter to the Galatians is that the gospel was preached before to Abraham in other words the gospel originates in the Old Testament and God's great promises and to Abraham God made seven wonderful promises if one reads carefully Genesis chapter 22 this is about Abraham, who having been promised a special son, is given a special son, Isaac. And when Isaac is becoming a young man full of promise, and the future is looking very different, because for a long time Abraham had been childless. He 
yet now he is told in chapter 22 to take his son and sacrifice him in the land of Moriah. Now if you see there Moriah, Moriah means, and the names in the Bible are so important, aren't they? Moriah means God will provide. Yah will provide. So the only thing that helped Abraham take his son to the land of Moriah to sacrifice was the knowledge that the place he was having to go to was the place where Yah, the name of God, would provide. And you will remember as you read Genesis chapter 22 how the wood was put on Isaac's back as he climbed the hill. And when he said, Father, here's the wood, there's the fire. But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham has to say to his son, Yah will provide. And they go to the place of sacrifice, and they both make the sacrifice. Isaac, the young man, allows himself to be bound. And Abraham actually takes the knife. And God stops. God stops. And a ram is caught in a thicket by his horns. And Isaac is set free. And the ram is given as the sacrifice. And you and I are meant to see, even in the book of Genesis, another father and son who would climb that hill together. And Moriah is one of the hills on which Jerusalem is built. The same place as Abraham and his son went. God and the Lord Jesus also went to the place of sacrifice. And Abraham was prepared and ready to do <coughs> it. And it's the New Testament that tells us wonderfully that he was prepared to do it because he believed that if God required this sacrifice, then God was able also to raise his son from the dead. And so there is a wonderful belief here in the resurrection. And now John is going to talk to us about how we see Jesus, particularly when we view him from the point of view of the Old Testament. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> right. One of the, of the f most frequently asked questions of Christadelphians, and it certainly is asked of me when I, I talk about what we are to people, is how are you different then from other denominations? And I have to answer, um, it, the most major difference is how we see Jesus. There are a number of variations, but the biggest by far, as far as other denominations are concerned, is our viewpoint on Jesus, his nature, who he is. Right. You see, we do not, as a community, accept what is popularly known as the doctrine or teaching about the Trinity. We don't accept that there are three gods in one person who are all co-equal. Jesus made it quite clear that he didn't believe that either. Um, the belief wasn't around in those days. But Jesus quite clearly said, my father is greater than I. I have to say that Christadelphians are not, in the strict sense of the word, Unitarians. I say that from the viewpoint that Unitarians and the Unitarian Church, and there is one, they believe that Jesus was purely a man and nothing more. Christadelphians don't, don't accept that. We do accept the deity of Christ as being the Son of God. And so we don't fall into that group of Unitarian people who don't accept that Jesus is any, anything more than an ordinary man. The Bible teaching is that Jesus is the Son of God. And nowhere in all of Scripture is he ever termed 
God the Son. What the Bible does teach us, and the book of Hebrews tells us this, that Jesus has been elevated above all creation. We are told that there is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. Because Jesus made the sacrifice that Jim has just been talking about. When Jesus, as Isaac carried the wood to his sacrifice, Jesus carried his cross in an exact parallel. And he became the sacrifice whereby we who are sinners can find salvation. And we are told that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. The promise is that he will return. Now, the subject of how we view Jesus is much deeper uh, than I've just said in two or three minutes. But because of time, I'm going to stop there, uh, and we can talk about that uh, at, at a later time. The promise is he will return. And Jim is going to tell us very briefly about the second coming of Jesus and the future. Jim didn't know that I put that very briefly in. What a wonderful hope. Not a hope beyond the clouds. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come. It wasn't that we were going to the kingdom. It's the fact that the kingdom is coming. And the Lord Jesus and his speech is recorded in Matthew, Mark and Luke. Uh, very clearly that when the world is in a very, very grave and serious mess, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Here's the passage. <coughs> the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the, a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the whole of God's creation, the gathering of the saints, those that have fallen asleep in death, and those that are alive, will be gathered at the coming, the return of Jesus Christ. But not only did the Lord Jesus prepare and preach this in the cities and towns and villages of Galilee and Israel, but the angels at the point when Jesus rose to heaven also confirmed as the disciples were watching Jesus go into heaven, they were not to be alarmed. This same Jesus which is taken up from you shall so come in like manner, the same Jesus in the same way, is coming back and that passage in Acts chapter 1 is so important and so as a result of this instead of the apostles being terrified they began to preach and to demonstrate the wonderful hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ and the hope of all true Christians is those built upon the wonderful promises that God gave to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and the Lord Jesus by his sacrifice and by his resurrection has made these things absolutely certain and if you want these passages afterwards then they can uh, be given to you so not only did the apostles preach it but it was the foundation belief of the church they were waiting and preparing for the fact that there would be a resurrection of the dead and that Jesus Christ returned would be king over all the world. And in fact, the purpose of Scripture is to prepare us for the coming of the Messiah. The whole of the Old Testament was designed to prepare Israel for the fact that God would send his son, the promised son, uh, promise to Abraham and the last prayer in the end of the Bible is even so come Lord Jesus and so the wonder of the faith 
uh, of the gospel and the hope in which all may live and confidently close their eyes is that the Lord Jesus will come when the world most desperately needs him. And this is a hope that Christadelphians want people to discover from the pages of Scripture. Now John is going to conclude his talk about the pastoral care and the outreach of our community. Thank you, Jim. Right. So there's where we've got to. Pastoral care and outreach. We're not a community that just go to church on Sunday morning every week and go back and get involved with our own lives and that's the end of it. We are very much concerned as a community with each other and with other people across the world. And so we care and cater for people who need help within our community. We have a group which is called the CIL, Christadelphian Isolation League. And we like to use those letters to uh, interpret the idea of that group, which is to cooperate with each other in love. There's another group called Meal a Day. We'll look at some of these in a moment. CBM is the Christadelphian Bible Mission, which deals with preaching and welfare issues in other lands where help and assistance is needed. <clears throat> We have what we now call CCH, the Christadelphian Care Homes, which includes a hospital called Olivet in Birmingham and residential care homes across the country. Then there is the ALS, or Christadelphian Auxiliary Lecturing Society, where people uh, around the community, we don't have a paid ministry, they can go and give talks, such as we're giving here, um, to other communities around the world, uh, Christadelphian communities. So it's not beholden on one person in one ecclesia, to use that word, to have to do it every week. But there's a change of speakers all the time. And we use that idea and that service throughout the world. And then, of course, there are choral societies and youth groups. And, of course, we have a, uh, both here at Down End. Right. So let's look at the isolation. What do the isolation need? What do they do? Well, there is a Sunday school for children who cannot get to a regular Sunday school. They can be sent lessons by post or on nowadays on the internet. There are exhortations, we call them. Most churches call them sermons, lessons for spiritual guidance, lectures and Bible exhibitions. There are Bible studies. There is a recordings tape library and they have videos and DVDs that can be sent out to people who cannot get to services and they can be as much a part of our community uh, as everybody else. And that's just one area in which we can help and assist everybody. And then for people who are uh, partially sighted or, or blind, there is a braille service uh, which is used. So that's a little bit, a very little bit, about the Isolation League. We mentioned another group called Meal a Day. And this is a, a group that was a charity originally set up to help third world people, not necessarily Christadelphians, get at least one meal every day. Hence the name. And today that charity has grown and it helps people to help themselves by sinking boreholes for fresh, clean drinking water. Uh, it supplies animals for self-help farms and small holdings. It supplies seeds and plants and horticultural and farming expertise. And these are one or two pictures that were taken by John and Jill, who are members here, uh, uh, of some of their things that they've done with the meal a day. Uh, this little chap on the top right-hand corner of the screen looks very happy. I mean, he's obviously a permanent invalid, but he looks very happy at the way he's being looked after. Children will always want to play around water. Uh, 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 and it's always been the same. It's the same the world over. And then in the bottom left-hand uh, side of the screen, you can see how a cow... This is a scheme called Send a Cow. 
And they send a cow that's already in calf so that they've not only got the milk, but they've got the next generation coming on in these little small holdings uh, out in African and third world countries. So that's a little bit about the, the sort of work that the Christadelphian Meal a Day charity does. And then there are the care homes. We mentioned this one, Olivet. Uh, this is up in Acox Green in Birmingham. And in, in actual fact, uh, most of you will know here that uh, Eileen's father is in there currently and we get the opportunity to go. I wish I'd taken the, the, the opportunity to take some more photographs, more recent than these, but these were 1997. A typical room on the first floor, uh, and this is very similar to where Rosemary Humphreys is at the present time, uh, who is from our bath meeting, you, you will know, uh, and she's in one of these rooms. And there's the Bible mission. Preaching and welfare in third world countries. There's a group f f showing family life in Africa. And there are people from here. Adrian goes out to African countries. A Bible study class in Bangladesh. I don't think anybody here goes out to Bangladesh. But uh, it's all over the world. People being helped by other people. Not just in this country. But from all over the world. There are centres which can send people to help people who are in desperate need. And when ecclesial halls are needed, people go out to help build. And this is one that was built in Malawi. So that's a little bit about the pastoral care and outreach that uh, we put to you about what the Christadelphians do. Uh, and that really brings our thoughts to a conclusion this evening. There's a lot more we could talk about, but obviously time doesn't permit. Uh, um